Welcome to Loving Christ, connecting God's Word to God's people one verse at a time. For Christians, every day is a day to celebrate God's love and grace shown toward us, undeserving sinners. But there is one day on the church calendar on which we give special attention to the truth that the Son of God died for all who have faith in Him and that He rose from the grave on the third day. We call it Resurrection Sunday. You may call it Easter Sunday. We believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave because without His suffering and dying in our place and His triumph over death, we would be without hope and under the judgment of God. On today's episode of Loving Christ, Dr. Keith Zachary shares with us how God has spoken to us through His Word and through His Son, Jesus. And when Jesus has something to say, we need to listen. We need to hear from Him. Happy Resurrection Day from New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. We hope you're truly blessed as you listen to the sermon entitled, Hear Him. Now let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 17 and prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God. And now, here's Dr. Zachary. We celebrate today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I've been welcomed many times this morning with He Lives, our Jesus is Alive, uh, And these are appropriate greetings this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I've been thinking this week about what would God have me say uh, on this special day other than He's alive, other than He is risen. Going straight to the text that would bring us to that particular fact, uh, the resurrection story. And uh, this is where the Lord's led me. So I uh, just want you to know that uh, this is what I think we're supposed to hear this morning, because really, this is how I think we should celebrate the resurrection today. Making mention of it, reading the resurrection story is definitely appropriate. Greeting one another with He is risen, He's alive is appropriate. But stand with me in honor of the Word of God and Matthew chapter 17 as I read something that I think the Heavenly Father wants us to hear on this particular day. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led uh, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when he had lifted up their eyes, they saw, when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So should I be telling this today? He is risen from the dead. This is a post-resurrection story. We're supposed to be talking about it. And what is the takeaway from it? Well, I'm going to tell you that this morning because this is how we're going to celebrate the resurrection. Tell this story After I'm risen, and that's what we're doing. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, speak to our hearts. May we walk out of this place uh, truly celebrating uh, our resurrected Lord and the power and life that we have in Him. And Father, I pray that you'll bless us beyond our expectations today and charge us as we go out into the world to be lights for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And so I'm just going to tell this story quickly. And then I want to move from this story, but I want you to see that in this particular account, they didn't really expect what they encountered. And that's the way it is often as Christians, or it should be. We're expecting things that God has planned, but we had not. Uh, We experienced things that God has planned, but we had not expected. And that's exactly what's happening for Peter, James, and John walking with Jesus, and suddenly, The Bible says that he was transfigured before them. 
And the way he appears is basically in his glory. His face was shining like the sun. His clothes became so white that it just looked like light. They couldn't really see Jesus. It was just bright. It was so bright to look upon. There was no way really to make him out. He was transfigured before them. And not only that, they had visitors, visitors from the past, visitors from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be very puzzled by this experience, as I'm sure they were. But Peter, being who he is, just couldn't be quiet. And he made a suggestion. It's good for us to be here, Lord. Aren't you glad that we came along? Why? Because, well, I just had this idea just went right. Peter's like this. He just has thoughts going through his mind, obviously, all the time. And he doesn't think about what he's about to say. And he just it just comes out. Really, what we can do is we can make a tabernacle. And that's an Old Testament tent. We can have a tent of meeting for Moses and a tent of meeting for Elijah and a tent of meeting for you. And so if we ever have any have any problems with the law, we'll come to the tent of meeting and talk to Moses. And if we have any problems with the prophecies, we'll come and talk to Elijah. And, and if we have any other problems, we'll come and talk to you because you you know all things, really. We could just come to talk to you. But wouldn't this be one? <laughs> Does that sound like a good plan to you? No, it's not a good plan at all. As a matter of fact, in other texts that are relating the same story, the Bible says that Peter didn't know what he was saying. And he does that a lot. He talks without thinking. But as he was speaking, while he was talking, the bright cloud overshadowed them, and the voice of the heavenly Father said, This is my beloved Son. Do you understand that? And in him I am well pleased. And what's the instruction that we have? Hear him. Hear him. And Jesus said, coming down from the mountain, now don't tell anyone about this until after I have risen or after the Son of Man has risen. And so as Jesus comes to life, resurrects from the grave, this is the word I think the Father would have us say to all those who celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Hear him. Hear him. As a matter of fact, this kind of aligns with Hebrews chapter 1. I'm sure you've read that many times, but I'll read it to you briefly. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, God, who at various times and various ways spoken uh, the past to our fathers by the prophets, and we would see, of course, that would be like Moses and Elijah. But in these days, how is he speaking to us? In these days, he is speaking to us by his Son, Who's he, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and up, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so, having become so much better than the angels, and chapter 3 will tell us so much better than Moses, and so who should we be listening to? Not necessarily to Moses, because all of Moses is fulfilled in Jesus. Maybe the prophets know all of the prophets fulfilled in Jesus. So who should we be listening to? The Father said, Jesus, hear him. Now the question is, what did he say? And there are many things that we could look at in the New Testament, what Jesus said. But I believe that the Lord Jesus wants to say to the church today, and this is how we celebrate his resurrection, we hear him. Seven things that he wants to say to the church. And one thing he wants to say to those who aren't in the church. And so where would we find those things? In the book of Revelation. This is the last time we're going to see Jesus. I mean, John on the Isle of Patmos sees Jesus in the scripture. I mean, we're going to see him as he comes. But look at this with me and follow along as Jesus says seven things to the church. Let me just begin in Revelation chapter one. So we have a story of him in all of his glory in Matthew 17. And the father saying, hear him, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hebrews says, we've heard from the apostles, we've heard from the prophets in the Old Testament, and the Father has said that, you know, hear him, and we have Jesus speaking. He is the last voice of the Father to us, the words of Jesus. And then we find this in Revelation chapter 1. Now, remember who was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. John, the beloved disciple, and that's who's writing this. 
In other words, he was there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he's right here on the Isle of Patmos, and what does he see? He sees Jesus in all of his glory again, the resurrected Jesus this time in all of his glory. The Bible says uh, in verse 12 of chapter 1, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about with a chest, about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flaming fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice sounded like many waters. And he had his, in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And that's not literal, of course. It's one thing about Revelation. You have to see symbol and, and real, realism. Uh, in different ways here. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Listen to what he says. I am he who lives. That's what we're celebrating today. Who was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. And then in verse 19, this is where we have it. The Father said, hear him, and here he is again in all of his glory, but now he's resurrected. He has paid the price for sin, and he's resurrected, and he's appearing to John, the beloved disciple, on the Isle of Patmos. And this is what we find. He says, Jesus says, hear him, write the things which you have seen, which we just read, and the things which are, that is, the church, which we're going to read, and the things which will take place, and we won't have time to read that because that starts in chapter 4 and verse 1 and goes forward. But let me just say this in verse 19. Here's John seeing Jesus in all of his glory and knowing from his first vision of that that the Father overshadowed them and said, hear him, and here's his opportunity to hear him in the last words that he's going to give us in the Scripture. And so this is what Jesus says to him, right. Now, this is a very important word, graphon. It's from the word grapho in the Greek. And basically what you should understand in the grammatical construction, that is how this sentence is given us, write these things which you have seen. Basically, this is an imperative. In other words, it is absolutely a command to write. But in the aorist tense, it is right with a sense of urgency. This must be done right now. This must be accomplished at the moment. And the reason he's writing with a sense of urgency is because those who read it must see also that it's given with a sense of urgency. In other words, when the Father said, hear Jesus, and now the next time John sees Jesus like he saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's speaking, and he's saying, now what I'm saying, I want you to write, and I want you to write it so that the people who read it realize you can't play with this. It's not time to be casual. It's time to be serious. You need to take this serious and do something with it. So what Jesus says to us through the writing of John here is something we need to give attention to. Are we celebrating the resurrected Christ today? Yes, we are. And how do we celebrate? We hear him. And what is he saying to us? Listen up. That's what he's saying. Listen up. This is something you must give attention to now. And I would like to say anything that you hear that just strikes your heart of what Jesus says through the writing and the pen of John the Beloved, you need to take to heart and deal with it when? Right now, this very moment, I have said many times, I I wish that all of the people who sit here and listen to preaching every week would bring a a notebook and write this, this sentence, God said to me, and then put past that what God said to you today, and do something with it. Pray about it and do something with it. But here are things that Jesus wants to say to all of us, and if something strikes you, because he's going to give seven things that maybe not all of them uh, are something you should hear, but definitely something we should give to the church. So to the angel of the church, as we come into chapter 2 and verse 1, just follow along. I'm not going to read all of the verses, but I want you to hear it. This is celebration of Jesus, hearing him, heeding his word. And so he says to the angel of the church, and that's not necessarily a heavenly angel, but a messenger that would be like the preacher of the church or the messenger's of the church to uh, of Ephesus, here's what he says. Now listen, is this you? Listen. 
He says in verse 2, I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, I know that you cannot bear those who are evil. I know that you've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered. I know that you have patience. I know that you labor for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, hear him. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. I'm talking to people who are gathering in churches today across this country. We need to hear Jesus. This is how we celebrate the resurrected one. We listen to what he says after all that he's done. And now he's resurrected, all accomplished. Now what does he want? He wants us to hear him. And that is the will of the Father. And what is he saying to us? He's saying to many who are in the church, you have been serving me. You've been doing everything that you know to do. You've been very faithful to persevere. You're here today. You'll probably be here next week. You'll be here next month. You're going through all of these things of serving me. But the problem is there's no passion, no love for Christ in it. And I thought about this as I was reading this again uh, this week, many times over. And I thought how awful it would be for us to start in following Jesus. And the latter days are worse than the beginning only because we learn how to do things and we become accustomed to doing things, and yet there's no passion for Christ in doing things. How many of you believe you can come to church just because it's Sunday? Sure you can. It's just the thing we do on Sunday. We just come to church. How many of you believe you can get involved in some ministry or activity that the church is engaged in, and you can do that and do that and do that, and all of a sudden you're just doing it and there's no passion in it. There's no love for Christ in it. You're just doing it. I'm telling you, God wants us to hear the resurrected Lord saying this is not acceptable. God wants us to worship him and serve him as the resurrected Lord by taking this word to heart and repenting of that and return to our first love. You know, when you were saved, I know many of you probably when you were saved, you were so excited. You wanted to tell everybody, but now that's waned and you seldom tell anybody. What's wrong with that? The passion is not there. I want to say that this is a common thing, or it wouldn't be in the letter to the churches. It's a common thing that people begin to serve without passion and without love. And so the thing that he says, and I'm moving through these quickly because I want to cover all seven, is that he says we need to repent from where we've fallen, and we need to do the first works, go back to the beginning, or else I'll come quickly. And this is the only church that he says this to. I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That is to say, God is not going to allow us as the church to live in such a way that we're just going through the motions because that would not be a testimony to his glory. He wants us to have the passion for him and the love for him. So I ask you this question. A number of years ago, how many? I can tell you exactly 15 years ago. Fifteen years ago, I was living in Mississippi. I had a walk. Believe it or not, I walked quite often back in those days. My doctor told me that I should walk two miles every day, rain, sleet, or shine. I should walk two miles every day. And so I started that practice, and I walked every morning. And I remember on this particular morning, I was walking my same trick, trying to get in my two miles every single day. And on this particular morning, I was just praying. I always pray when I walk. I, I was just talking to the Lord and 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 we were just having our fellowship time together as I sensed his word to my heart through the scriptures that would come to mind. And one scripture that came to mind, and I don't know, just came out of the blue like that. And the scripture was, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And the question that came to my mind, why would God give me that scripture? Because the real question was, do you love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength? And I'm going to tell you, I continued to walk without answering that question. I walked and I walked and I walked and I said, Lord, I want to say honestly that with all that is in me, I love you. I love you with all my heart, with all my strength and all my soul and everything that is in me. I love you like that. But to be honest, I'm having a hard time answering that question because I want to be fully honest. Is there anything that distracts me from my love? 
relationship with you? Is there anything that interferes? Is there anything that comes between us? Is there anything that I have in my life that doesn't allow me to be totally and fully committed and all in to, to, to service and love of you? And so I walked and I walked and I walked. I may have walked more than two miles that day because this question wouldn't be answered and I couldn't come to an answer. Now you may look at me and say, well, every preacher ought to love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm just being honest. Every Christian ought to love God that way as well. That's why I'm reading this to us this morning. But God knows sometimes we don't. And sometimes we may be engaged in service and we don't have the love that we should have for the Lord. But I would say to you, That before that walk was over, I said, God, you know where I am, and I'll do anything. In my love for you, I'll do anything that you want me to do, anything. Just name it, so that I can prove with all my heart I wouldn't hold anything back from you. I got home, and my wife said, you got a phone call from Bobby Leach in Denham Springs, Louisiana. (laughs) And I said, I don't know Bobby Leach in Denham Springs, Louisiana. And this was my first contact with the church. And I called uh, Dr. Bobby and he said, uh, well, I'm from New Covenant and uh, we're looking for a pastor. And I said, well, Lord, I just said I'd do anything. Uh, I, I said, with the conversation I just had, this is kind of uh, ironic that you would call this time. I said, I think I need to pray about answering that. But uh, that, that started the ball rolling. I'm here because I was struggling with a question 15 years ago, and 15 years later, I'm putting it to you. Do you love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? I'm not asking you, do you serve Him? This church was obviously filled with all sorts of activities, but I'm asking you, is the passion for the Lord there? How can we tell if we have passion for the Lord? I know I I have seven points, so I'm moving quickly. But the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's one way. There will your heart be also. And and I know some people are saying, I knew the preacher would get on giving sometime. If you know me as the pastor of this church, I hardly ever preach on and hardly ever do. But it's one of the sure ways of being able to tell that we are in love and engaged uh, in our love for the Lord. When we give, not only of money, but of our time sacrificially, When we give, when God says, I want, you say, here it is. And I do know this one thing that uh, in our giving here, and I just want to say something in passing. This is just in passing. We did mention that we we receive offerings through the box. We receive offerings through uh, email. But I want you to know something that I feel strongly about. I I feel like when we put uh, our giving as a draft from our bank account, I feel like sometimes we lose the passion in our giving when it's just like it's like bills. It just kind of is subtracted from the balance every month. And God spent time putting it on the heart of men to sit down and write us a love letter that's like this. Can we not take time to sit down and write a love offering to the Lord that has some passion in it, where we express our love to him while we're writing it out? where we say, Lord God, I love you, and I love you in, in, in obedience to you, and I'm giving because this is one way that I can continue to check my love. And if God says, hey, stop writing the check and giving what you give every week or every month, it's time for you to give this, and then you might have to say, well, I love you, and I'll give that. But it's one way, the Bible says, that we can't separate our giving from our passion where your, where your heart is. That's where your treasure goes. So we have to think about that. Just one, but there's many other ways, and we'll come to them as we took a look at these other churches real quick in Smyrna in chapter uh, 2 and verse 8. And so hear him. What is he saying? And he says this at the end of every one of these messages. He says, he who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he always mentions some reward that's coming to those who are overcoming these problems. But in chapter Uh, 2 and verse 8, he says, and to the angel of Smyrna, what's wrong with this church? The Bible says in verse 9, another problem we may have, you may have. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He says, do not fear any of those who are about to Uh, Those things you're about to suffer, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
You say, Pastor, what in the world does that mean? What, what are you saying that the Lord's saying to us? Well, first of all, he's telling us that, that his people will suffer tribulation. And what I want to say to you about this in particular is the Lord is reminding us that no matter how comfortable you may be, there are many believers in other parts of the world who are not comfortable. Right now today, there are brothers and sisters on the other side of this globe who are suffering. They are suffering only because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. This church is a suffering church And Jesus is speaking to them, but he's speaking to us in the sense that he makes mention that you should think about a suffering church. You should realize that many people are being thrown into prison. Many people are being separated from their families. Many people are suffering to the degree that probably they will not live out this year because of the persecution that they will have to endure and they're going to be tested. The good news that Jesus says to those who are actually in the midst of suffering is that it is only going to last 10 days, not literally again, but it just mentions that the scope of it is going to be limited. It's not going to last forever. It's going to be limited. And when it is over, he says, I promise you in the next life, you will be free of all suffering, and you will have a crown of life If you remain faithful unto death, he says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So he who has an ear to hear, listen to that. So we have means of supporting these people. Let me ask you this question. Just listen. Number one, do you love the Lord with all your heart? Are you loving? Are you serving with love in your heart? Has your passion waned? Number two, do you think about people who are suffering in this world only because they know Jesus? Do you pray for them? And there are ministries that we have available that you can support them. We have the uh, voice of the martyrs that we, that we support. You can support these people and make sure that ministry gets to the family of those who've had the leadership of their family removed and thrown into prison. But on the other side of the globe, this is what it says. You say, well, what does it say here where there are Jews who say they are not, but are the synagogue of Satan? In the first century, the Jews, of course, began to persecute the church, as did the Roman government. So when you have government and religion joined together, persecuting the church, you kind of had the first century picture. So the Jews, but they're not really Jews. They're, they're Jews outwardly, but not inwardly. And a real Jew is one inwardly who has the faith that Abraham had. And so they're not real Jews, and they are persecuting the church. And along with that, the arm of the law, so to speak, the government, the Roman government is persecuting. Today, we have governments over on the other side of this globe that are Islamic in their policies. They live by the, the law of Islam and the Sharia law, and, and they implement that law. So the, the law is Sharia, and the religion is Islam as well. So you take those two together, and, and they persecute anything that's contrary to them. And so we have Christians in these countries being persecuted. We, we know this because... We have people who can report this to us, and we see it all the time. I have uh, received for a number of years World Magazine, and it does tell me about these things uh, that are happening all over the world. And I would like for you to know if, if you remember that there have been people who have been marched out to the beach in their prison orange uniforms just because they're Christians, and there they left this world kneeling on a beach as these people who have the arm of government and the arm of their religion to persecute the church. Does that not break our heart that there are people today who are suffering and being persecuted? Hear him. I'm concerned about these people. I have words of peace to speak to them, and we should have words of prayer to lift them up. I think every Christian who's walking with the Lord should be praying for those whom they know to be suffering for the cause of Christ. And verse uh, number 12, we're introduced to Pergamos. And in Pergamos we have, I know your works, I know where you dwell, the th- where the Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name but and, deny, uh, and did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas, my faithful servant or martyr, uh, was killed among you where Satan dwells. So here we have a church that is being faithful to the Lord. There's a lot of persecution in this church. Some martyrdom, verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. This is what our resurrected Lord wants us to know, uh, that uh, there is a doctrine 
And the Nicolaitans was also mentioned, by the way, up there in verse 6, the doctrine and the practices of the Nicolaitans. Let me tell you another thing, that we as Christians must hear our resurrected Lord say, there is an attempt going on here, going on today, to totally distort, distract, and destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is an attempt here in the text and going on today where people are trying to invade the church with teachings that are totally contrary to the message of Christ. And I would say if we use the Old Testament illustration that is being given to us, it is like Balaam and Balak. And if you don't know that story, then I encourage you to read Numbers 25, 1 through 13 and 31, 16. You'll find some information there. But here's what it was, basically simple so that we can see it. What is he saying? In the Old Testament, there was a, a, a man who wanted Israel to be cursed. His name was Balak. He hired a prophet, a preacher, a prophet to curse Israel. That was Balaam. And so what we have is a preacher for money contradicting truth, compromising his call, and really trying to do what he is being paid to do, but he can't do it. He can't curse Israel. So Balaam goes back and says, look, let's do another deal. I can't curse Israel, but I I can tell you for money, I can tell you what I think you ought to do. Uh, Why don't you have uh, the, the harlots of Moab entice the men of Israel into relationships, and it'll mess everything up, I promise it will. And you say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with this text for certain. But in our day, we have people who for money are saying anything that people want to hear and gathering large crowds, just as Paul promised Timothy, that many would come to this point and place where they want people to tell them what they like to hear. And if you will say what they like to hear, you will have many of them. And if you'll sell your call, if you even had a call, Balaam, if you would sell your call to teach a doctrine that is contrary to truth, many people will come to that. We have in our country today what uh, is called the prosperity gospel. It says basically this. Gain is godliness. And Paul made it very clear that when you hear such a message, it's not the message of God. From such, withdraw yourself, Paul told Timothy. But godliness with contentment is great gain is the whole message of Paul. But in this day, Balaam was willing to sell himself to the highest bidder. Balak, I'll do whatever you want. I'll say what I can. I'll help you in any way I can. A a prophet is selling himself to the highest bidder. And I think we have a lot of this going on today. And so I just want to tell you, when you tune in on the channels that we have available to us today to hear other messages, whether it's on the radio, whether it's on the television or on the internet, would you please exercise caution and prayerfully and carefully listen to your radio, to your television, and watch your internet? Because there are many preachers who want to do one thing, They just want to distract you from the truth of the Word of God. False teachers are everywhere, and Balaam was just that. Be careful, and Paul. uh, Jesus says to the church, hear him. Jesus said, this is something you need to watch out for, so we need to be careful there. Thyatira in uh, verse 18, the fourth church, and this is what he says. Uh, Jesus says, I have some things against you in verse 20. A few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. Oh, well, we don't want to talk about her, do we? Uh, She called herself a prophetess. She appointed herself to be a prophetess and to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, eat things offered to uh, sacrifice to idols, gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, but she did not repent. So I'm going to cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. You're saying, preacher, this cannot be what God wants us to hear. It is exactly what God wants us to hear. It is Jesus speaking to the church. And so we thought we were done with Jezebel way back there in the Old Testament. What is Jezebel? Jezebel represents a spirit. It is a spirit of Jezebel. Not that she comes back to life, but the spirit that she had is going to be once again seen in our world. And what is it? She basically appoints herself to be a prophetess. And if we remember Jezebel well, she wanted the authority to rule, and she did. She ruled even over the king, her husband, 
and she did things pretty much as she pleased. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with everything according to this scripture because she begins to take God's servants, my servants, and introduce them to a life of immorality. Now, I can't put a face on this Jezebel spirit, really. I'm not telling you that I have anyone in mind when I say this, but I can tell you how Jezebel worked, and maybe you can figure it out for yourself. I believe in the Old Testament, Jezebel was like this. She had many prophets, many prophets, and her intention was to squelch the voice of all true prophets. If you remember, I'm just going to tell you a story, and if you don't know it, you can look it up in Second Chronicles 18 through 20. When Ahab was desiring to go to war against a people, and he called Jehoshaphat from Judah to come and consider going with him to war, Jehoshaphat said, well, let's hear from God. And Ahab called the prophets of Baal. That's all they had, pretty much. There was one prophet, one prophet in all of Israel that really spoke for God, Micaiah. And when he called for all the prophets, he purposely excluded Micaiah. I don't want to hear from Micaiah. He's always preaching the word of God to me. I don't want to hear it. What do I want to hear? I want Jehoshaphat to hear prophets say, go up and prosper, because this is what always happens when I call the prophets of Baal. They want to say, basically, what do you want to do? That's what you want to do. That's what we're going to do. So he called the prophets of Baal, and yet Jehoshaphat said, 400 prophets, I still haven't heard the word of God. you have any other prophet? Because this was the assignment of Jezebel, to bring so many voices in, preaching so much uh, that is contrary to the will of God, that people began to think thoughts contrary to the will of God. And that's what happened. So basically, here again, we have another attempt to bring in false teachers into our world, into our life, into our homes, to teach us to become lax in our morals, to teach us to be unfamiliar with the word repent, and to teach us just to live as we please without any consideration of the consequence. Well, I believe basically if we can leave those false teachers over there in Pergamos, or we can leave those false teachers in Thyatira, we come to a church that I think is more familiar to maybe our understanding or our experiences, and that is the fifth church in chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible speaks of the church of Sardis. You know what's wrong with this church? You know what Jesus wants to say to some people today? You have a name, basically, that you live, but you're dead. And what little life you have, verse 2, is ready to die. I have not found your works perfect before God. So in chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, Remember, therefore, how you received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not, watch, I will come to you as a thief in the night, and you will not know the hour that I will come to you. Jesus is saying to this church, there's nothing living. It's just death. There's no real church. There's no real life. It's just death. Now, I want to say something briefly, and I'll, I'll pass over this quickly because it is, in our, it is in our study, and we'll come to it. But I've heard people say, you know, I believe God has written Ichabod across that church. How many of you ever heard the word Ichabod? And what does it mean? It means the glory has departed. And I want you to know something. God never wrote Ichabod across the door of any church. Because, because the word Ichabod didn't come from God. It came from a woman who was having a baby at a bad time, and she said something that she thought was true. The glory has departed. And it wasn't true. God had plans. The glory has departed. But I can tell you what we can say for certain. Not the glory has departed, but there are many dead churches in our world. They don't have life anymore. The life of the church is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. People aren't praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that is, to be controlled by the Spirit in their life. They're not praying that the evidence of the Spirit would be manifest in their life, which would be love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and faith and temperance. They are not working in the power of the Holy Spirit, seeing God manifest 
a more Christ-likeness in their life day by day. There are many dead churches, but here's what the Lord Jesus is saying to this church. You have some life left. There's still some life. You're still here. What do I do? Do what you did before. Hear the word of God, receive the word of God, and act upon the word of God. That's what you were doing when you stopped hearing and receiving and acting on the word of God. You've you've died, basically, and what's left needs to be strengthened. So you remember, remember how you received and heard. Revive that. Number six, the Church of Philadelphia, and praise God, let's breathe a fresh Air that comes with the Church of Philadelphia, a church of brotherly love. We don't have anything to say negative about any of them because basically this church is a church that is exercising the evidence of the absence of all that we've been talking about. These people love the Lord. There's no doctrine that is contrary to the truth. No one's coming in trying to entice the church to to do things that are immoral. I mean, we have all of these. This church is alive, and you know why it's alive? Because it has the love of God in it. The Bible says, this is what Jesus says, I know, verse 8 of chapter 3, I know your work. See, I've set before you an open door. No one can shut it. You have a little strength. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not but a lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my commandments to per- persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which is to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So this is a group of people who are living in such a way that Jesus has nothing bad, no reprimand, no rebuke, no correction. But this is what you're doing, and you're doing well. So continue. The love of God. It is one thing to have the love for God, but it's another thing to have the love of God in our hearts. And that's what he's saying. This church has a brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia means, a brotherly love. And therefore, you're experiencing what I want the world to see, the love for God and the love of God going out to the world. And we come to the last church now and the last problem, and that's the Laodiceans in verse 14. So seven words, seven churches, many problems, some We come to Philadelphia, it's a great church, things are going great, maybe that's the way it is with you. But to the angel of the Laodicean church, basically here's the problem. People are so given to the world and the things of the world that they are indeed lukewarm. And Jesus says to this church in verse 16, So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say you're rich and wealthy and have need of nothing, you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, unable to discern their real condition. I counsel you, verse 18 of chapter 3, to buy me gold refined in fire that you may be truly rich and white garments that you may be truly clothed and that the shame of your nakedness would not be revealed. And anoint your eyes if you can, but you can't, with eyes out that you may see. Jesus is just saying to this church, you have such need, and yet it's covered up by all the things that you have, that you're enjoying, that you're living with, and you don't see yourself as God sees you. And so it is the last church that he speaks to, and it could be the last condition that is prevalent in the church in the last days, a church that is given to materialism. And that's the seven things God wants to say to the church. But there's one thing he wants to say to those who aren't in the church, just one message. And I think we could use verse 20 to get to it, not necessarily that it is to the person outside the church, but one thing's for certain, what Jesus says in verse 20, he's not in a relationship with a person, so this seems to be acceptable to use. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And that is an invitation of Christ to those who are not yet saved. When we started out, we were reading in Matthew 17, and there were two people standing with Jesus. Moses and Elijah. Listen to this carefully. This is for you who... Do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen, 
Moses wrote the law. Elijah was the leader or the spokesperson or the representative in this case, rather, for the prophets. The law and the prophets. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus is meeting with them for this very reason. Because all that is in the law is being held against you. You have sinned. You've broken the law. Everyone in this place has. There's no exception to this. And God wants me to say this to you. Hear him. Hear Jesus. I'm standing at the door knocking. What's the problem? I'm outside. I'm not inside. I'm not in a relationship with you. What's the solution? You have to hear this word. You have sinned against God, and because you've sinned against God, broken the laws that are outlined by the pen of Moses as God instructed him to write. You are outside of a relationship with God. You do not have a relationship with God. And yet Jesus, and here's what we miss many times on Easter Sunday. Jesus came and lived a life of 30 years doing what? Living the law. Do you realize in Jesus' life, not one time did he think a thought, say a word, do a deed that was contrary to the law of God. All of his life was absolute surrender to the Father. That is, doing the will of God. Fulfilling the law. Now, why would he do that? Why didn't he just come to earth and very young just give himself in some way to be sacrificed for the sins of the world? Because he had to live a life to acquire a record, a record. To, to, to obtain a record of holiness in the flesh. In other words, the law has been fully lived out in the flesh in the person of Jesus. And yet Jesus also is a fulfillment of all the prophecies of the one who can fix that problem. Jesus was the fulfillment of every prophecy of the one who who would come, who could fix this problem. And when John the Baptist saw him, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus lived the law, and yet he went to a cross, and he died on that cross to pay the penalty of breaking the law for those who couldn't live the law. He was on the cross as your substitute. Now listen carefully. That righteous life he lived is just there. That sacrifice that he made for your sins is just there. And he was put in a grave. And according to the Apostle Paul, if he didn't come out of that grave, nothing's changed. But he did come out of that grave. So that he can not only knock and tell you, I'm here, but he's available to do something. He's available to take all that sin that you have and take it and make certain that it is uh, applied in his sacrifice. That is, his sacrifice is applied to removing that from you. And not only that, but then he can also give you his righteous record So that when God looks at you, he doesn't see the life of sin you've lived. He sees the life of righteousness that Jesus has lived. Would you like that kind of exchange today? That's what the resurrected Lord wants me to tell you. If you're outside of Christ, I will take all of your sin. Thank you very much. I paid the penalty for that. I suffered on the cross for that. And I lived a holy life, and I want you to have that. So that when the Heavenly Father looks at your record and opens it up, it says, hmm, that's total holiness right there that you have. That's right. My favorite verse, if you're visiting with us today, is 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God the Father made Jesus the Son to be sin for us, he who had no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What an exchange. And I just want to say to you, church, 
with all the lovelessness that may be in our example and all the persecution that we do not consider and the compromise that keeps going on and walking in and walking out and the corruption sometimes we see in the church and the deadness we see in the church and 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 the, the sometimes the faithfulness that we see in church and the lukewarmness we see in church maybe we've muddled the waters a little bit so if you came here today and said well you know I don't know if I really want to be a christian i've seen a lot of unpleasant things in christian lives well i just preach to them for you to say to all of us that's not acceptable And God wants change. And yet the same Lord who is telling them about the corrections that need to be made in their lives so that they can better represent Christ, that same Lord is saying to you, doesn't matter what the church needs uh, to fix in order to be a faithful representation um, witness. It doesn't matter. Stop thinking about that. Those seven things were for them and not for you. The thing that is for you today is to come and say, Lord Jesus, I want to give you my sin, and I want to receive your righteousness. And that's what the resurrected Lord wants you to hear, and that's what he wants to do. Bow with me just for a moment. I believe that you may have come to Easter services many times and just heard the resurrection story, and it is the story that is so glorious, how Jesus comes to life. He lives, but he lives to speak to the hearts and lives of people. He lives to change lives, to change eternal destinies. He lives to live through his people by the power of his Holy Spirit. And we all need to hear him today. And so those of you who've heard him in a correction in your life, if anything spoke to your heart, deal with it today with a sense of urgency. Those of you who are lost and you need to exchange that life of sin for a life of holiness, you need to respond with a sense of urgency. So while we wait for a moment, I want to ask you this question. And it means nothing if you respond to my question. It means something only if you respond to Christ. Listen to me carefully. If you came into this place, and you heard something that God wants you to correct in your life as a Christian, are you planning to do something about it right now? It doesn't matter if you say yes or no to me, but it does matter if you say yes or no to Christ. And if you're lost, and you have nothing but a life of sin to face God with, and you want that exchange to take place today, would you, with a sense of urgency, Deal with it right now and give Jesus all your sin and trust him that everything he did on the cross was necessary for you to have this exchange. He did it for you. Would you ask him to forgive you of all your sin and then accept and embrace the fact that he's making you holy in Jesus today? My asking you to do that means nothing, but you're responding to the Lord to do that means everything. And I trust that the Lord has spoken to your heart. Father, thank you for gathering a group today to hear your word. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And may we walk out of this place unable to shake the word that you wanted us to hear, the very one. And I pray for those who need to be saved. May they truly, with brokenness, and repentance, turn to trust Christ for the holiness that is provided to them today through Jesus. And God, we thank you today that we will one day, with our own eyes, see the resurrected, glorious Christ and all his majesty and glory. And today, we only echo his words in obedience And we pray that they have been heard for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there. This has been a production of New Covenant Church, all rights reserved.